Hi, welcome to the second lecture in the course CSC 351 which is Introduction to Data Science and this chapter is also titled Introduction to Data Science. Alright, so what is data science? So we are attempting to define data science but the problem is that it's still very new. It's an emerging field and because of which we don't have um, it very well defined. But we do have an understanding that data science is a stream where we will have some important components as exploratory data analysis and visualization, some component of machine learning and statistics, and as well as we may have a possibility of using the high performance computing because we might need to handle a bigger data set. And for that, we, will, we might need high performance computing. Now let's move on uh, to this slide, which I believe is one of the very important slides so in this lecture. This is figure that you're looking at is called data science Venn diagram. And this data science Venn diagram is because of a very well known data scientist named Drew Conway. So Drew Con Conway came up with this concept and he has defined data science in a very nice way. So for that to understand, let's look at these three circles that we have in this picture. The one circle that you're looking at here on the left, he called it a hacking skill, hacking skills. The one that you have on the right hand side at top, uh, he called as math and statistics knowledge. And then in the bottom, he called that as substantive expertise. And now using these three circles, when he put one circle on top of the other, he figured out and he highlighted that data science is something in the center of all these three intersecting circles. So each of these circles represents a skill. And for a data scientist, the data scientist is required to have all these skills. So that's the reason you have the data science as the intersection of these three circles representing three skills. So let's try to understand what he means by each of these terms. When he said hacking skills, then by hacking skills, he is referring to uh, the skills that relates to programming. He wants a data scientist to be skilled enough in programming so that uh, the data scientist could uh, pull the data, uh, could write some code to clean the data, to apply some libraries on the data, and can make sense of uh, uh, the program if that program is given to uh, the data scientist. So uh, it's not required that the data scientist should be a, a very skilled programmer, but the data scientist should have a decent programming skill so that the data scientist can uh, write some scripts, uh, can read the data with ease, can apply some existing uh, libraries which are available. Uh, so if you're looking for an example, I'll say uh, the data scientist should be comfortable uh, playing with the languages like Python or R or similar languages uh, which are very handy uh, in reading the data. Uh, and you know, and uh, which are good uh, uh, to to uh, use some um, libraries like Python. If the data scientist knows decent Python, then we'll consider that yeah, that that data scientist has this hacking skills. Now, what is this math and statistics knowledge? Uh, so this person who wants to be a data scientist should also have a decent understanding of maths and statistics. Uh, you might ask why is that required because you know um, in this in data science we often need to apply some machine learning algorithms and we, if we're using those machine learning algorithms just like a black box then that is not a good news we should know how these algorithms work what is it that is going behind these algorithms so the knowledge of maths and statistics is also very important at least some decent level of maths and statistics is required for a data scientist. Then the third important skill is the domain science. So we can also call that as domain science, but uh, 
uh, to call that as substantive expertise. So what do we need, uh, mean by substantive expertise? Assume that um, there is a company and that company is hiring the data scientist and the company has got some project in finance. So now this, the data scientist that the company will prefer would be one who has hacking skills has maths and statistics knowledge background but also understands finance a little bit okay so all these skills are required then only uh, a data scientist would be considered a decent candidate now this in this picture if you're looking at you will find some inter interesting regions like this which is the intersection of hacking skills and maths and statistics so what is this region okay so you might wonder what do we call this region so this region is machine learning so using this uh, Venn diagram you can think of uh, or you can come up with the definition of machine learning if you don't know about it anyway we will uh, give you formal definition of what machine learning is but uh, we can uh, conclude some definition from this uh, Venn diagram so the intersection of programming which is hacking skills and math and statistics knowledge uh, may represent machine learning so in machine learning if you try to understand it usually uh, that's a mix of computational skills when those are applied with uh, 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 when they are applied to uh, the math and statistics uh, you know background so mostly in machine learning basically uh, we have the um, we have the algorithms in which we learn from the data that's how you know machine learning works so which will involve the programming skill as well as uh, the background in math and statistics so that's what people in machine learning do and how about these two intersection you mean uh, we mean this math and statistics circle and the intersection of that circle with substantive expertise so this will be traditional research so we need to understand this thing like what is traditional research so traditional research refers to the research which is being done by people in um, uh, conventional uh, uh, what I should say uh, research domains like uh, probably medicine um, biology social science so what do these people do so these people have very good background in the subject that they are doing research so a person who is doing research in political science will understand political science pretty well and in order to do the research in political science they should also have some maths and statistics knowledge so that uh, the results that they are they are getting they could make some sense out of those results so for traditional research you need substantive expertise as well as the expertise in maths and statistics so that's what traditional research is called now this is an interesting intersection the intersection between hacking skill and substantive expertise so this is called as a danger zone and this is a very interesting uh, uh, you know article if you want to read probably you can uh, go to this link so this intersection of the hacking skill and substantive expertise is very dangerous why is that dangerous because if a person has decent programming skills and uh, knows the domain a little bit but lacks totally the knowledge of maths and statistics then that is a very bad combination because in order to be successful as a data scientist just knowing hacking skills and substantial expertise is not enough because you will have to use some machine learning um, algorithm but without math and statistics you may not know how those algorithms work all right so this intersection is dangerous all right so i don't know how much you followed but the main idea of this slide or the main message that i want to give to you is about data science where exactly data science is and this is a it's a very standard way of defining data science so i'll say that you should take this message that data science is an intersection of computer science right if you're comfortable with these terms then please use these terms hacking skills and substantive ex, uh, expertise 
and maths and statistics these were the terms that uh, drew used I'll, I'll be okay if you're using computer science for this circle statistics for the second circle and domain science for the cir third circle which means uh, how well do you know the domain uh, of the problem that you're trying to solve so if you are working on a data science project that relates with the health data then I'll expect you to know at least that minimum uh, amount of uh, dom uh, amount of uh, the health uh, information which helps you to come up with uh, the meaningful uh, result all right so let's move on and see what else we have now these are some interesting things that we are about to discuss and it has to do with uh, the philosophy like how a computer scientist thinks and how a data scientist should think so for the next few slides we will try to understand like what our background is and how should we try to think if we want to become a better data scientist so let's start that discussion so it says that if you want to be a data scientist a successful data scientist then you should start respecting the data you should appreciate the importance of data so let's see uh, why we are making this claim computer scientists do not naturally appreciate data it's just a star a stuff to run through a program the usual way to test an algorithm uh, performance is to run the implementation on a random data so what do we mean by this so this paragraph is uh, actually aimed or is directed towards the computer science when we consider computer scientists as those who are developing algorithm so what do we do when we create an algorithm so we spend good time we um, come up with um, you know a very efficient algorithm and just to prove that the algorithm is efficient what do we do we would generate some data randomly and then we will run our algorithm on that randomly generated data we'll do some analysis uh, we will evaluate the runtime we will do uh, we will compute the time complexity we will compute the space complexity and if we find that our result is better than what has been reported uh, we will claim that as a victory so the point is that we are checking our algorithm on a data which is generated randomly okay and we don't care about the data we just use the data which we generated randomly which is an artificial data which is not a real data we don't respect that we just throw that out and what we emphasize more on is our algorithm this is something we will have to change in data science okay so we'll have to start appreciating data because the data that we'll be working on in data science will not be in any artificial data it will be a real data from some domain it could be a medical data so that medical data on which you will be working would be a real data okay so similarly uh, you can have uh, sports data you can have the financial data so all these are real data so we'll have to change our approach we'll have to appreciate the data we'll have to understand the data we'll have to respect the data okay so that's the point about this slide now data sets are scarce resource as well right so this is another thing we need to understand in data science uh, when you're working on a research project if you're lucky that you're getting a data from some collaborator then that is a great news otherwise if you want to work on a problem and you don't have a data then it's very very difficult okay so the point is that data is a scarce resource and those people who are generating this data they are spending a lot of time in in generating that data so if you go and talk to the people who are working in domains like life science or something like anthropology or political science it takes a lot of time for them to gather the data before even they start gathering the data they need to plan they spend nights they spend days weeks and months and at times years to gather that data okay so that data is important so we will have to 
um, learn this um, this thing, uh, you know, the respect for the data. So interesting data sets are scarce resource which requires hard work and imagination to obtain. So that's the point. Now again, you know, in the next few slides, we will be discussing computer scientists versus real scientists. When I'm saying real scientists means those people who are dealing with, uh, you know, the real data. We don't deal with real data uh, very often. Okay, sometimes we do, but not very often. So now what scientists do, scientists means the real scientists do, not computer science people. So they strive to understand the complicated and messy natural world while computer scientists build their own clean organized virtual worlds. Okay, and thus nothing is uh, ever completely okay. So here we have this point again about computer scientists versus the real non-computer scientist people. So again, uh, we can understand this point by taking an example. So if there is a, a person uh, who is doing research in life science, uh, a scientist who is working in um, life science related domain, they understand this fact that when they when they they deal with uh, you know the real data set, then the reason that this real data set is coming from the natural world and natural world is complicated uh, so the data will be messy there will be issues with the data when we are collecting the data then in the data we might have noise we may have outliers right and we may have a lot of challenges and we'll get into these challenges probably um, in, in next few few uh, lectures so the real scientists they do understand that the world is not a uh, an ideal pay, place we have uh, uh, you know the messy uh, world so the, the result would be the data which may not be ideal which may not be clean which may not be as ideal as was the randomly generated data uh, by um, a computer scientist who was uh, working on an algorithm right it's not so simple it's not that easy it is complicated so as a data scientist when we will be working on a real data which is which might be collected by uh, somebody from a different domain say a biologist then we should be ready to you know uh, we should be prepared to uh, accept the challenge that the data will have uh, noise the data might be messy the data might be very challenging okay so there's nothing like true and false why we are saying true and false because that has to do with the way computer science has been defined in computer science we deal with binary a lot right so much so that you know even our data is represented in terms of binary bits zeros and ones hardware also accepts them uh, the signals in zeros and ones so so that's the message the message is that uh, we work differently than the real scientists all right I, I hope these things are making sense but again these things are a little more subjective but um, believe me uh, the discussion would be more objective as we move on to the techniques of our data science probably from the next video lecture okay so again uh, you know the other differences between the computer scientists and the other real scientists uh, their research is data driven whereas our research is algorithm driven so um, as I was giving you the example and I'll continue uh, taking that as an example uh, for uh, for researchers who are working in life science or maybe um, you know in chemistry in physics you name it uh, they collect the data or they will have a research problem they will have some hypothesis and they need to or either approve or disprove the hypothesis that they are starting uh, with but for that they need data so their research is data driven but for us for computer scientists our research is more algorithm driven so that needs to be changed if we want to uh, work in data science okay and uh, uh, this is again a very interesting observation and uh, I would like you to understand if you have now thought about it. 
that scientists they make discoveries right so let me read this point and then i'll discuss scientists are obsessed about discovering things whereas uh, computer scientists invent rather than rather than discover so here i'll uh, assume that you understand the difference between discovery and invention if not then please pay attention so discovery is something which is already there in in this world or the universe and there are people who are trying to find that out as an example well there might be a plant species somewhere but nobody knows about it so what a, a researcher in botany will do the researcher in the botany will try to somehow find that out and report that and that will be called a discovery all right so similarly there might be a drug which already exists and the scientist has to discover that drug all right so similarly discovery means things are there present but we have to find it out and that's what real scientists they do they spend a lot of time and they they they, they put a lot of time they put a lot of effort because they know that this thing exists somewhere but nobody had find that nobody was able to find it so i want to be the first person to find that so that's the discovery whereas invention is slightly different in invention we create something okay so like uh, somebody invented an algorithm or so much so you know you can apply that to technology also uh, television television was invented by a scientist all right so invention is something that you are creating uh, which did not exist whereas a discovery is something which was already present but nobody knew about it so the scientists they they want to become the first person to find that out and report that to the world so the scientist and the computer scientist that we are comparing here we are referring to the scientists who are discovering these facts and we are calling computers uh, computer science people as those people who are inventing algorithms who are inventing solution to a problem i hope that is making some sense now what do we have in the last point here the scientists are comfortable with the idea that data has errors computer scientists are not so that's again you know um, a philosophy i would say Uh, this philosophy is about the kind of research that we are doing since the scientists are dealing with the real world and real world has all the kinds of challenges real world is not a perfect place so these scientists the real scientists they accept the fact that when they are venturing in this research they will encounter error so they will have some uh, scope to ha- they'll have some um, you know approach to handle these errors whereas computer scientists i mean as i gave you the example in case of uh, the scientists who's developing algorithms we, we don't un- don't necessarily you know consider errors in our research well when i am saying errors then i am not referring to compiler errors and bugs right these errors means uh, the error in the data okay uh, in which we want to work on all right so now let's move on to another aspect which is genius versus wisdom so here again we are trying to um, you understand that what do we need to be a data scientist so here um the concept is that these programmers right programmers means us as well we are, we are from computer science major and we want to learn what is data science so the computer scientists are considered genius okay if you are not anyway you are doing computer science you will be a, you will be a genius you are learning the skills of programming you are learning the skills of algorithms and data structure and if you are successful in learning those skills you will become genius now the genius people they they are hired or the programmers are hired to develop programs and um, programs that means software uh, so that's the purpose why software engineers are hired and they are genius whereas uh, 
the role of the data scientist is different. So I'm not saying that the data scientists are not genius. The data science, it's okay if the data science is genius, that's, that's, that's a, a great skill to have. But what is required more than genius is having a good wisdom. All right, so the requirement for the data scientist is that the data scientist should have a very good wisdom. All right, so let's try to understand these little uh, subjective issues. Uh, and here in this lecture, we are trying to understand like what are the important things uh, that a data scientist should have or you should have so that you can perform well in this course and you might pursue data science as your career. Okay, so what a genius tries to do? So genius always tries to find the right answer. Okay, so genius will try to find the right answer. Whereas what is wisdom? Wisdom is that skill which will avoid the wrong answers. All right, so we want that skill which should uh, avoid um, you know wrong answers. So we should always make an attempt to find better solutions, good solutions. We should not uh, find answers which are totally wrong. We are not looking for the perfect answer. We are not looking for the right answer, but we don't want to get the wrong answers, right? So wisdom is slightly relaxed than genius, I'll say, in, in this presentation. All right. So, but wisdom is difficult, right? So don't don't be misled by the fact that we are not as ambitious as genius, and we just want to avoid wrong answers. But being uh, having a good wisdom is not easy. So in in the next slide, we'll discuss like what's the best way uh, to improve wisdom. All right. So for a data scientist, like most of the things, uh, we need a good wisdom. So data science, like most things, benefits more from wisdom than from genius. If you are genius, great. Uh, you need to anyway work on your wisdom, right? So if you have a good wisdom but you are not too genius, you're good. You're good for data science. All right, let's move on. Now the point is, well, I want to become a data scientist and I'm not sure about my wisdom, but I want to improve it. So what are the ways in which I can improve my wisdom? Well, the answer is that, you know, you can have a good wisdom, you can improve. Excuse me. Uh, you can improve your wisdom. But the point is that for wisdom, you need experience, right? So wisdom comes from experience. And wisdom uh, comes from general knowledge. Wisdom comes from listening to others. Wisdom comes from humility, observing how often you have been wrong and why and how. So these are some important points that you should keep in mind. And well, these are important also for the reason that, you know, if you came across a brilliant data scientist and you want to be like that data scientist, then probably that person had that person must be having a very good wisdom and the wisdom that he has got is because of all these things that this guy has done he must be having he or she must be having a, a great experience must have worked on a lot of data science projects and interesting thing about data science is that you need to know about other domains also if you remember the Venn diagram that I showed you in the second or third slide of this lecture a data science Venn diagram, uh, which was by Drew, then there is a circle at the bottom, which is about domain knowledge. So domain knowledge is very important for a data scientist. And since a data scientist would be working on more than one project, so it is required for the data scientist to know a little bit of most of the things. And how will that come? That will come from general knowledge. So, uh, if you were thinking that, you know, I just want to master Java and databases and, you know, I want to live happily after and I want to, uh, and that's what I have to do, then probably data science is not the field for you. 
for data science you should be very much up to date you should know what is going around you you should know about different domains you should know a little bit about finance you should know a little bit about politics you should know a little bit about medicine and all those things because the chances are that you might get a very exciting data uh, from any one of these domains and you may want to do research in that right probably I mean uh, look at the COVID thing right now okay so if you are given a COVID data how can you come up with the interesting results only when you know about the sufficient biology when you know about virus when you know about COVID what it is how it spreads and all those things right so yes wisdom is important that comes with experience you need good general knowledge and how do we get that general knowledge well there are a number of ways you can read newspapers you can read books you can watch news you should also listen to your friends you should also listen to the experts from these domains so that's the reason data science is challenging you're supposed to continue learning okay and how do you learn well you need to be uh, observant you need to look at what other people's are, people are doing discuss with them what they have done discuss with them what problems they are solving what data they are working on how they are generating that data so on and so forth and another very important point right here is that uh, when you are getting the wisdom from your experience that this implies that in the process you will go wrong right so um, everyone makes mistakes so you will also make mistakes in in your career as a data scientist or while you're working on a project in data science you may go wrong you may start with a model that will give you horrible results but you should remember that uh, you should learn from 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 the results that you got i got a horrible result in prediction why did i get the horrible result how should i fix it all right so all these things if you're doing you are improving your wisdom all right so that's about your wisdom thing curiosity is another trait that a data scientist should have so if i give you a data right um, probably i might give you a data in a homework or maybe you know in your project so you should have curiosity only with curiosity you'll be able to come up with some interesting output so data scientists should be very very curious should uh, uh, should be uh, should be curious to know the hidden facts in the data and uh, should be curious to know the domain right so if I gave you um, say a data set uh, which is um, related with medicine and I ask you to you know um, have a look at it and let me know what you think about it what can you find uh, and you don't have any curiosity about uh, med medic medicine I mean about the data that I give you probably you won't do a good job okay so that's the point about curiosity so what a uh, data scientist ideal data scientist should be doing data uh, ideal data scientist should be involved with people a lot right so what you'll do uh, if the data set is about medicine you will kind of you know either google it out you'll try to find out um, the domain you'll try to learn about the domain either by browsing on internet or maybe talking to the person who's an expert on medicine somehow you need to uh, uh, first have curiosity and then using the, that curiosity you should be able to uh, learn as much as possible from that domain okay so curiosity is uh, another very uh, important um, attribute of a data scientist now this is again a very interesting point uh, which professor Skina has mentioned in his book and my slides are from his book and his slides uh, and I agree with him it says that uh, it's a good exercise for us for all of us and more so for those who want to be a data scientist to read newspaper every day why he wants us to read newspaper because when you're reading newspaper then uh, you'll get to know what is going on around us okay and probably you will find out something that that you were not interested in reading 
right but since it is printed on the front page of a newspaper you'll be forced to have a look at that at least you will read the heading of the news all right so these are the things that an ideal data scientist should have should should be aware of what is going around the data scientists or what is going out uh, is happening in the world so that will help you or that will in a way uh, improve your wisdom okay now there's another interesting point which is about asking good questions all right so uh, what is this uh, good uh, asking questions in a way all these things are related you know I might link asking good questions to curious curiosity any person who is curious will ask questions all right so as a data scientist also you should ask questions if I give you a data set immediately you should ask question and for those questions you should try to find out uh, the solution from the data set all right so asking good questions is also one of the very important attribute of a data scientist okay so uh, this again an interesting comparison right here this comparison is between data scientist and a software developer now no offense software uh, software developers are great people genius people but uh, often when they start their career uh, they are given uh, strict restrictions like you know this is the um, this is the product that you're working on and these are the requirements that we have to satisfy and this is the piece of uh, software that you have to design and there are strict uh, you know specifications like what goes in what is expected to be as output and often uh, I'm not saying always often you are not uh, encouraged to ask questions right so whatever you needed to know is already given to you now try your best and finish this design or implementation in a specific time but in data science you are encouraged to ask questions why because you know without asking questions you can't uh, uh, you can't uh, you know find something which is in there all right so asking question will also help in being curiosity in, in being curious all right so what kind of questions you should be asking now one good thing about asking questions is that the next few slides that I have are about some data sets and related questions like what questions we can answer if someone is giving us the data all right so in a way the data science is about asking questions and finding the answer for those questions from the data that you have all right so what questions a data scientist should be asking to improve the knowledge of the data scientists uh, so the questions could be you know asking those people who have generated the data like you know what exciting things uh, you are able to learn from the given data set and what things do you or you uh, your people really want to know from this data and what uh, data sets might get you there so these are the kind of general questions uh, which a data scientist might ask those people who are giving the data to the data scientist so that the data scientist has some idea about what to look for what is a valuable um, result that this is, this guy should be looking for all right otherwise if we don't ask any question data is given to us we are doing our own stuff and after you know maybe a few months we are reporting uh, to the you know the person who has given the data like you know I came up with this result and the person who gave the data to us might not be interested in that result at all so it's always a good a um, uh, good point to ask questions for data scientists ask this question to the person from where you are getting the data all right because you may not know everything about the data you have to learn uh, about the data from those people who are providing you the data set all right so I hope these things are making sense to you uh, although these are a uh, little subjective let me know if you have any questions okay now enough of uh, 
the subjective issues let's look at some data sets and try to understand that how are these data sets interesting and what kind of questions we can ask about this data set and if we can ask these questions probably we will have the answer to those questions also what is needed some uh, intelligent analysis of that data okay so uh, for the remaining of the lecture I will take you to four data sets these data sets are about baseball which is a sports data uh, about movies I have um, the IMD I, I am DB it should be uh, yeah there's a typo it should be IMDB and then we have Google and Graham and New York City taxi cab records all right so let's look at one data at a time and try to see what what do we have there and what kind of questions we can ask from that data set all right so let's start with the baseball so here we have an interesting uh, website which is called baseballreference.com and this website has the data about baseball games so it has uh, the baseball statistics for every player in major league baseball since 1888 which is a huge data so you have the information about a lot of players and the players from 1888 right so now when you have the statistics about baseball players then what information do we have and how can we use that information what interesting thing can we report from this data set so I have a snapshot of some data just to give you some idea about it so here is this baseball uh, player is supposed to be one of the greatest uh, Babe Ruth so um, let's look at this person um, his position was outfielder and pitcher uh, sorry I'm not very good with baseball but I'm trying my best and this guy bats uh, used to bat left and throws left so when you have this information that he bats left throws left you should assume that this guy was lefty and then you have information about his height his weight you know when was this guy born this guy was born on February 6 1895 in Baltimore and he died on August 16 1948 when he was 53 years in New York all right so that is about his personal information okay uh, now what do we have here so if you go to this website like baseballreference.com you'll got tons of information about um, the players the baseball players so now uh, this information that you have on the right hand side is also about the same player Babe Ruth so here we have the information about financial transactions that means when he was bought from one team how, 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 how much he was paid uh, when he moved to the different team uh, how he was released so on and so forth so the point is that we do have all these uh, this information available it is up to us how can we use that information right so look at the salary as well so we have the salary about this person when he was at age 19 he was at the team Boston Red Sox his salary was dollar 350 you know you have other details and as he aged from 19 year to 39 years how did his salary change so this is just for one player just think about it right from 1888 to till now so many players we have so much of information about these many people right now it is up to us this data is given to us now what can we find out of this so finding anything starts with a question you will have to question yourself like from this rich data what is it that I can find all right Good. let's move on and continue the discussion all right so uh, that was about salary and the personal information you have the information about uh, the other um, aspects as well about the batting of this player about the pitching of the this player fielding record 
and the team records and the awards that these people won right so you have uh, the batting record of uh, this guy all right so it is up to you like it, it, if you have to work on this data, I'll say that the first thing that you need to do is know about the sport. Okay, you'll have to learn about baseball if you don't know much about baseball. Then only you'll be able to find something interesting from this data set, right? But there are a lot of interesting things that we can find out. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. And right here we have the questions. So what are the questions that you might have in your mind if I give you this data set? Well, you might wonder that, you know, we have so many players, how to rank these players, right? How to evaluate their skills, how to evaluate their value, how to evaluate their performance. So skill, value and performance would be interesting attributes and you'll wonder like, you know, what's the difference between skill? What is a value? What is the performance? So skill means how skilled this player is, right? And the skill may not be, well, it should be related to the value. Value is probably uh, how much this um, player is being uh, paid. So that's the value, I believe, of, of the, the player. The player is skilled. And, you know, if the player is skilled and is experienced, probably the player will have very good value. Uh, but again, this should be uh, supported by the data as well. And often we will have a skilled player, a valued player also, but is the player also giving good performance? All right, so all these traits you could evaluate from this data set. Okay, so you can have this question like how to best measure individual players skill, individual players value, individual players performance. Okay. Now, what's the other point? Well, you can also see here we have the information about every um, player. Uh, we also have the information about uh, how much salary they are getting. Uh, we should also have the information like how much a team is paying uh, for a player. So it seems to me that often the teams trade. Uh, they buy the players from the other team and when they are buying the player from the other team probably they are giving them some money So was the trade fair or not? That's the question which you might answer after doing the analysis of this data set so uh, say a team a bought a player from, um, uh, B from a team C so now after buying that uh, player, how did the team do? How did this player uh, do in the new team? So the money that was paid by team A to team C to get the player B, was that uh, good or not? Was that uh, good deal or not? All right, so these kind of things you can do. And these are some questions. You might think about many more questions based on this data. How about the third point? What is the trajectory of players performance as they mature and age so this is very intuitive right so when player is young uh, it is assumed that the player will be good but may not be experienced and as player gets slightly older um, improves the skill gains some experience probably the player would be even better and then this improvement should continue for a period of time and then with the age it is assumed that the performance might go down. So all these analysis you can do, you should be asking this question, you know, you have the data about the players uh, for a really good time. So should I look at the, the performance trajectory of each player? All right, so that can be done. And how about this? To what extent does batting performance correlate with the position played? Right? Yeah. That's a, again a very interesting question. Uh, you can ask this question and you know these are interesting, important and very good questions. And you should develop this habit as a data scientist to ask questions. Given a data to you, you will have to come up with the questions. Without questions, what will you find from the data set? Okay, so if I delete all these questions and if I just give you that data, you, you may have to, you know, maybe spend some 15-20 minutes just thinking about uh, the questions, right? 
so if you're intelligent probably uh, and if you if you're able to understand the data you might come up with questions like this or even better okay so these were baseball related questions there's an interesting thing for you in the next slide demographic questions right this is something I found really surprising and I'm um, I'm, uh, and I like this you know the data is about sports but the same data can be used to answer demographic questions as well so what are the questions like well if you remember for the player that I was showing you we had this information that the player bats left and pitches left so the point is that this is such an interesting data where for every person you're also recording the fact that whether the person is left-handed or the right-handed so now when you have this data about a lot of people and in this data you have this feature also which distinguishes the fact that whether the person is left-handed or right-handed and you know the date when the person um, was born and for most of the cases you have the date when the person died so now using this data you can answer this question which is do left-handed people have a shorter lifespan than right-handers all right well you'll get an answer on the basis of this analysis um, well I don't want to comment upon the validity of that uh, finding but this is something you can conclude from one sample which we have available all right so if someone can give me even better sample uh, you know then I'll have a better result which I'll trust more than the result that I will get using this data uh, the baseball data but since I have this information in this baseball data about the people being left-handed or right-handed and their lifespan so I can conclude I can come up with uh, this uh, I can give you the, the result like um, the lifespan of left-hander people is short or the lifespan of the right-hander people is short. and this has nothing to do with baseball this is a demographic uh, question that we have asked okay good so now uh, how about the second question this is interesting too how often do people return to where they were born now the point is can I answer this question well if you look at the data then you'll find that for every player we have uh, the the place of birth as well and we also have uh, probably the information like where the person died all right so from that you can conclude this thing right the person was born here and the person spent the last days at the same place so this information versus the information whether the person was born in place A and spent the last days in place B. So this is possible to be done on this data set. But you know you need to be uh, wise enough to ask these kind of questions. So you, you will be uh, able to do that when you are curious, when you are thinking a, a lot about questions, when you are thinking about data as well. Okay. How about the third point? Do player salaries reflect past, present, or future performance? Interesting, right? So, if this, uh, you know, this is something which will involve their salaries with the time. Okay, so uh, salaries with the time as well as the performance. So, can we answer this question? Yes, why not? We can answer because we have salary information. We have their performance information we have their uh, past and future uh, past present and future information as well how about the last one it says that are we heights and weights increasing in the population well we can answer this question because we have the data about the people starting from, uh, about the players starting from 1888 till date right so more than 100 years of data we have yeah, we can find their heights and weights and we can uh, um, analyze that and maybe with the just plotting we'll have the answer to this question which is uh, about uh, about the height and weight is height and weight uh, changing or increasing in the population okay so good 
there were some interesting questions that we looked at uh, about this uh, baseball data. Now to, moving to another interesting data set, IMDB, right? So IMDB data has uh, the data about movies and some television programs as well. And this data uh, is um, has approximately 6.5 million titles, which means a lot. And it has uh, the information about 10.4 million personalities. And this data is as recent as Jan of 2020. Okay, good. So a lot of data. Now we are looking at a snapshot of a movie. It's a wonderful life, which was released in 1946. So that information you have in IMDb. You also have the information about the duration of the movie. Then for genre, you have that it's a drama, family, and fantasy. You have the description about the movie. So all these, um, all this data is important, right? So we have a lot of data. Now it depends on us. What do we want to find out from this data set? So the name of the movie, year when it was released, the length of the movie, genre of the movie, description of the movie, the name of the director, the writer's name, producer name, composer, cinematographer, you have the cast as well and the cast information I have in the next slide. You have the rating of the movie which is 8.6. You have the budget of the movie. You have release date. You have awards information. So a lot of information about each uh, title. Okay, the title includes the movies as well as the TV programs. And I was surprised to find that they even have uh, you know the video games in the listing this is something I should uh, look into to make sure that that's the fact okay so that was about a movie and we have this actor St uh, James Stewart so if you want to know about the actor you have information about the actor as well uh, he was born in 1908 died 1997 and then you know uh, for the information, in May of 20, he was born in uh, Pennsylvania. And you know, you can go on and you'll find more information about this actor. You also know about the different movies that this guy has worked on. Okay, so for, for, the, for the actor also, you can have a lot of information. Now here we have the cast of the previous movie, which was, the, the name of the movie is, It's a Wonderful Life. So here, these are some casts in the movie, and you can find the details of each cast and crew. Okay, great. Now about movie, right? So what we are doing in the in these slides, we are doing this exercise. So in the lecture, we started with the definition of data science. We established how data science is different uh, from computer science and what a data scientist should be doing. Uh, data scientists should have a very good uh, wisdom and then data scientists should be curious, uh, should ask a lot of questions. So now we are looking at the data sets and practicing this habit of asking questions. All right, so we've already done that for baseball. Now let's do the same thing for movies. What interesting questions can we ask on movie data set? So here we go. Now using this data set that we have for movies, some, uh, wait a second, how many movies do we have? 6.5 million, that's a lot. Okay, can we predict how well people will like a movie? We can, right? Probably we'll have to um, build a model. And then since the data has all the attributes, data has these uh, ratings uh, so it is possible to do we have the data it is possible to do but yes you need to come up with this question you need to come up with the problem like you know I want to do it I want to predict how well people would like a movie uh, and how can you do that well this data will help you you will have to learn a model from the, from this data 
Don't worry about modeling and all. We have not gone to that extent yet. We are just learning about data science. Okay, so we are learning about data science. We are uh, getting ready for the challenge uh, of our data, to the challenge of uh, applying data science. Okay, so how about this? This is more interesting actually. What does the social network of actors look like? Well, that might be a little complicated right now. We will say that on the in, in the very second lecture, this guy is talking about social uh, network. Mm, how come? Well, for that we will have to make some assumptions. Social network would involve uh, the connection between all those people who are working in the same movie. So we'll have to make some assumptions. So we can build a social network using IMDb. And as goes my knowledge, people have used IMDb a lot in their research when they are working on graph algorithms, graph, graph data mining and all that. So how do they build the graph from this database? Well, they will have these actors as different vertices in the graph. And if these actors, they worked together in a movie, then they'll connect those actors with edges. And that's how you'll form a graph. A very complex graph, but you will have a graph where the vertices are different actors, or probably directors, if you want to include. And then these vertices would be connected if they happen to work in the, a movie together. Now there are a lot of questions, you know, uh, we can answer once we have a social network form. Now the question is that, can we form a social network, right? So the answer to that is yes, you can form a social network using this, uh, this data and people have done that in the past. And once you have a network, sorry, it's not a network, once you have a social network, yes, then you can do a lot of, you know, graph analytics on that. Okay, so what's the next point? What is the age distribution of the actors and actresses in film? This is an interesting uh, question actually. And this is based on the fact that sometimes the age difference that you have between the main actor and the actress is quite huge, right? So we may be interested in finding out the, the distribution of age difference. Right, so I will assume that in most of the cases the actors are older than actresses. But how how about this difference? How much is the difference? Right, let's look at uh, the distribution of that, which will be again a very interesting question, and the result would be interesting too. Now, how about the last question? Do stars live longer uh, or the shorter lives compared to? Uh, the other people who are not stars, right? Some uh, people who are playing, you know, smaller roles. Uh, so, well, it's a question, and that's that's an interesting question. Uh, since we have the, uh, you know, the information about date of the birth of the actor and when did the birth of the actor die, so we can find out their uh, age, how much they lived. And then let's do the analysis of those uh, big stars uh, versus those people who were playing smaller roles. Okay, or rather than people with the smaller ro roles, we can also pick the general people and can have some analysis. Okay, so that was our movie. Now, another data set. It is a, about a data set that we have from Google. So what Google did, uh, Google came up with a very interesting project in which uh, they started scanning all the published books till now. So there are a lot of books published. So they could not complete all, uh, the scanning of all the books, but they, ha they are done with 15% of all the published books, more than 15%, I believe. And this number is huge. More than 15% means about 30 million books have been already scanned by Google. And what is Google doing? Why is Google scanning these books at the first place? Well, they are doing it for their own search. They want to make their search more efficient and for that purpose only they are scanning. How they are doing it? Let's not get into that right now. Now, what is this Google Ngram project? This is interesting for us. 
So what they did actually, they um, collected the phrases and the words, uh, words and phrases and the length of the word and phrases is from, uh, a phrase would be from one to five words. Okay, so let's stick to phrases. They collected the popular phrases. So what is popular? I will explain. Popular words or phrases of length one to five words. That 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 is the length that they considered, and they have they considered the phrases which were popular. Now we need to think about like what was their criteria for considering the phrase as popular. So if a phrase happened to occur more than 40 times in total in all this collection, they will consider that as popular, right? So that is uh, a decent, you know, uh, is good parameter. I'll say 40 times is good. So if any phrase happens, it occurs more than 40 times, they will consider that as popular. And for these phrases that they have, they came up with a time series. All right, they, they came up with the um, with a time series, annual, uh, annual time series. So that's what we have. They, it presents an annual time series of the frequency of every popular word. All right, so I have an, uh, a plot. So I'll use that plot to explain that to you. So let's think about um, a phrase. And in, in the example that we have, phrases also include the name of people. So Albert Einstein we can tre treat that as a phrase comprising of two words Albert and Einstein that means a scientist Albert Einstein so in Google and Gram if you search for Albert Einstein you will find like how frequently this name Albert Einstein was used every year okay so this uh, Google Ngram project is also very interesting in doing some very useful uh, analysis. Okay, so I hope you understand understood that what Google Ngram did. One more time, in this project, they have scanned a lot of books, and after that scanning, they figured out the phrases and the length of the phrases from one to five words, and they looked for the frequency of these phrases every year so it's the annual time series okay so how many times Albert Einstein was used say in 1900 right and how many times in, in 2000 2010 2005 so how many times this was mm, this figured out in the publication and there was is a notion of popular they only keep the information for those phrases which happened uh, which occurred more than 40 times all right, so this is Google and Gram Viewer. I'll encourage you to go and play with it. I did the same. So right here, you're looking at um, the Google and Gram Viewer for three phrases: Frankenstein, Albert Einstein, and Sherlock Holmes. So what is this time series showing? So time series means a plot which changes with time. So here, this graph that you're looking at, which is in green, it shows the frequency of uh, the term Frankenstein starting from 1800 till now. So that's an interesting uh, curve, right? So if you see, it was very low. It went up a little bit, a little bit, little bit, and it was kind of uh, saturated till 1960, and something happened. That's something we need to figure out, right? So something happened. Probably somebody came up with a novel, or there was a movie about Frankenstein, or something happened which made Frankenstein popular. And after that, you can see that, you know, there is a jump in Frankenstein. All right, so the Google Ngram viewer can help us in finding some interesting insights, right? Because we have the frequency of um, uh, the, this term every year in 1800. That was the percentage of Frankenstein. But as the time passed by in 1820, this frequency increased a little bit. Uh, right here, it is more than what we had previously. But then kind of, uh, you know, almost the same, then went up a little bit. 
uh, not much increase but from here you can see that you know a big jump so that means that we should look at this year after 1960 right here and then we should further explore like what was the reason behind the jump uh, for this phrase Frankenstein and how about um, Albert Einstein so this is simpler right why do you see the rise of Albert Einstein phrase after this time because you know if you go and look at the um, at the profile of Albert Einstein then uh, probably he was born around this time uh, somewhere after 1900 I looked but I forgot right now when Albert Einstein was born and then probably till this time he was not known uh, he must have been pretty young then he started doing some research then that research got uh, published he got more recogn recognition and so on and so forth he's still here right that means his in his yeah, you know research is still popular right so that's the reason he's still uh, in, in, in still publishing right we still have the mention of Albert Einstein how about Sherlock Holmes well you can look at that probably around 1880 around this time um, the, this um, character got into existence and then you know it has some rise and fall right so the point is you have the data from Google and Graham. Now it is up to you. What do you want to do with that data? So with this data, if I tell you that this is the data we have, we have the frequency of uh, the phrases. Um, we have the frequency of the phrases from the different uh, books which have been scanned. Now what can you do with it? All right. So now you have to think about questions what questions we can ask on this data set so an interesting question is that since we have the frequency of every phrase annually which is in the form of the time series can we look at this data and find out how is the cursing changing over time right so if you use some uh, you know, curse word and search for it then you should be able to see the, uh, the time series and the time series will give you some idea about uh, how it has changed are people using it more more now or did people use it more before and when did they start using it that's an interesting thing the second point is even more interesting and the textbook i think has an example uh, which is about some technical words Right, so you might like to search for data science. I did that before preparing the lecture. I looked for data science, and you uh, find the mention of the data science as very recent thing. Uh, as far as I, I remember, I think uh, I, I saw this time series starting from somewhere 2000 after 2000. So that gives you an idea like when did this technology come to existence? So, data science is something that. Now, we said that it is a re recent, um, you know, domain, I mean, it's a very recent thing. So you should not find the mention of data science in 1950s, okay, so it has to be a recent thing. So the lifespan of the technologies can also be evaluated from this Google and Graham data set, okay. And you can see that whether the technology is going up or decreasing, is it getting more popular? Or is it, you know, is dying? So all all these interesting answers uh, we can get, and we can have corresponding questions as well. Similarly, about new words, right? When did a new word emerge? How often new words are coming up, and do they stay in common usage, or do they die after some time, right? So, like slangs and all those things, also you can look for. What words are associated with other words? That is, can you build a language model? So this is slightly complicated. Uh, this topic for that we'll have to have some idea about language models. So I'll say let's not discuss this one. We should be able to, you know, get some decent idea by focusing on the first three questions. And you can think of parallel questions as well. 
All right, so the last data set that we have for this lecture is New York City taxi cab data. This is also a very, very popular data. A lot of people have used it in their research. So what do we have in this data set? Uh, we have this data about taxi cabs, which are there in New York City. So we have the information about the driver. So driver will have uh, an ID. And then we'll have the information about pickup location, the drop-off location, the fare uh, that the that the passenger had to pay, the trip duration we have, uh, the trip duration we have, the amount of tip that the uh, passenger paid, right? And yeah, so <clears throat> we have a lot of information related with the taxi um, trip. All right, so you can see right here when the pick up time, drop off time, and there should be tip somewhere, tip amount. All right, so now the point is that when somebody is giving you the taxi data, what can you do with that? Do you have some questions? Well, interestingly, a lot of questions can be answered. A lot of questions can be asked and we can find the corresponding answer. So, how about this? How much do drivers make each night? Interesting, right? Uh, we do have the time information. We can exploit that and probably find the answer to this fact that uh, how much the drivers are making each night. Are they making more in night or versus day? At what time they are earning more similar questions right how far do they travel that's interesting too right so are they doing, getting the local rides or, or are they going far uh, you know what's the maximum what is the minimum and what are the places where they are going to what are the places from where they are picking up the passengers they are dropping the passengers and how and uh, how about the traffic congestion you can get some idea about traffic congestion as well so if the trip is taking longer between the two points then you can infer that there is probably some issue with the traffic all right and this should correlate with the rush hour in the morning when you have the office time people are rushing towards the office you should expect lower traffic similarly when people they are leaving office in the evening rushing for their home then again you should expect a lot of traffic all right so these kind of questions you can ask on taxi cab data all right and similarly where are people traveling to of at different time how do they travel on weekends is the travel same or Comparing the travel on weekend versus weekdays, right? And about the tip, like which driver is getting more tip? What's the reason this guy is getting more trip? So these things you can conclude from this data set. Are the faster drivers getting tipped better? Well, you can calculate the speed of uh, the driver and uh, correlate that with the tip. And where should the drivers go to pick up the the next fear well this is something you will have to find out on the basis of the density of the passengers right if you know that people are taking uh, uh, cabs from a specific location say it's about New York City how about you know somewhere close to Times Square right but this is something you should get from data don't randomly pick that location as Times Square right so you'll have to find from uh, the taxi cab data like which is the location from where the maximum passengers are getting picked up so probably you will uh, conclude that uh, a taxi driver should be hanging around that region so that the taxi cab is getting a lot of uh, customers all right so this much uh, i have for uh, this lecture all right, I'll see you in the next video lecture. Bye-bye.